All right. If you're watching this stream on YouTube or uh, Periscope or any other service, uh, just uh, go to um, my, let's see, May maybe it's good if I post a link, but uh, you can go to my Discord and ask questions there. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be um, converting my ADC measurements into voltage and current. Uh, and um, so that I can then use uh, the values expressed in millivolts or uh, amps. Um, actually, I'm going to be just printing them in millivolts and milliamps, but uh, I'm going to be expressing them in uh, as a floating point value representing amps or uh, volts. And uh, to do that, uh, I have to do a simple calculation based on the gain that I've chosen on the uh, MOSFET driver and uh, the value of the current sense resistor. So let's have a look at the PCB. Uh, the PCB looks like this. So this is my motor controller. Uh, this is the current sense resistors. Uh, there are two current sense resistors per motor uh, controller. There is two motor controllers on this board. And um, uh, the value of this current sense resistor is uh, 5 um, milliohms. So uh, using the ohms low, uh, the, uh, the voltage across this resistor is going to be um, uh, Let's see. Or the current, the current uh, through this resistor is going to be the voltage divided by uh, the resistance. So the voltage across the resistor divided by its resistance, uh, and the, the voltage across this resistor is measured by the uh, current sense amplifier inside this DRV eighty three hundred two chip, and then it's output with a gain of um, ten or forty. Um, on uh, on the output of this uh, current sensor, and that's the value that is then fed into the ADC on the STM32, uh, and that's where I measure uh, this value using 12-bit ADC precision. So the the range is uh, 4096 uh, units per uh, the um, the value of the reference voltage for the ADC, which is 3.3 volts. Uh, so one one unit of the ADC uh, measurement is um, equal to uh, three point three volts divided by forty ninety six. Uh, so let's have a look at the board. Uh, what the board looks like in let's see on the video. That's what the board looks like. This is an assembled board, uh, and um, when I I'm just going to power on my control panel and uh, uh, now, now I can uh, move the motors. Uh, so this is uh, one servo and this is another servo and uh, I can now move them using the joystick. Uh, let me see here. I have to restart this video because it seems to have screwed up. So I can, I can move the motors using the joystick, and uh, I can print the ADC values here. Um, so this is the raw, uh, so the value here, um, actually all of these values are the raw measurements of the current. Uh, it's the first motor A and B resistor, and the second motor A and B resistor. So you'll see that when uh, one of the motors moves, uh, when the first motor moves, then uh, this one will go either up or down, depending on direction, and this will go in the opposite way. So let's have a look. So that's... You can see this one, this one consumes more current. This is the, uh, the big servo. It's this servo. Uh, it has much higher current consumption because it has a gearbox. So it's, it takes a lot more energy to um, get it spinning. 
uh, and um, now I'm going to convert these values to um, to amps. And uh, to do that, um, so as you can see, this is a this is a bidirectional uh, current sensor, so. Um, the value uh, is close to uh, 2048, which would be the midpoint, uh, but it's, it's not precise. Uh, so uh, using the DC calibration um, input on the DRV chip, uh, we can get uh, these values to be fairly stable and then measure the zero point, uh, the actual zero point uh, that is being output uh, from, the, uh, from the current sense amplifier. And uh, based on that, we can then uh, subtract that zero point from the measured value and get uh, either positive or negative integer, which will um, correspond to the, uh, to the measured AGC value of the current. Um, so let's have a look at um, what will happen if I set the DC calibration uh, on. So when, when the DC calibration is turned on, uh, this is done by, let's see, I'm going to just close this. So the DRV chip has DC calibration uh, input, which is located here. Let's see. Uh, DC calibration. And uh, when this input is uh, high, then uh, the chip will disconnect the current sense resistors uh, from the current sense amplifiers, and uh, it will just output the DC offset of the zero point. So. Um, so the DC uh, and the output of the of this of the current sense amplifiers is then not affected by anything that happens uh, on the motor side here, uh, which should give a fairly stable um, reading from the ADCs. So let's have a look at what happens if we just toggle this pin. First of all, I'm going to just double check that uh, it actually has to be high. Uh, when DC cal is high, device uh, shorts uh, inputs of shunt amplifiers and disconnects loads. DC offset uh, calibration can be done through external microcontroller. Uh, so what I'll what I'll do is uh, I'll add a command to my um, DRV chip um, device driver, uh, which is going to appear as a console command in uh, in this console here. So this console runs on the chip, on the STM32. Uh, so I will add um, a little bit of code here to set uh, DC cal. I can just do a string comparison. Then we're going to set the GPIO. Otherwise, we're going to reset it. Uh, if
So let's enable the DC cal and see uh, what what value we get. This would be DRV8302. Uh, we'll start with the first one, uh, DC cal on, and then um, uh, the data. Do we get anything? So as you can see now, when I when I move the uh, the motor, uh, I don't actually uh, see any change in the first uh, set of values, which means that DC cal is actually working. Uh, so this would be the the zero point. Uh, this will need to be saved uh, into uh, into a variable or into EEPROM uh, on the board uh, and just uh, used as a as a calibration value. Um, so the question is, how am I going to structure the code here? Um, let's see. Should I put this directly on the higher level? Like ideally, I should be, uh, I should probably have a, um, I should probably place this in the DRV uh, driver. Um, but the the problem is that I haven't uh, thought out a good uh, interface for um, for like a more generic interface for motors, um, where uh, I could perhaps have the DC calibration as one of the commands or something. Um, so this this needs to be. Um, I guess I'll start. I'll start just by um, getting uh, the measurements and the, and just saving them somewhere. Let's see. I could start with a simple interface, like a like a memory interface, um, and then move on from there. Maybe maybe create a, a more uh, specialized interface later. So I could start with a memory interface, and I could have um, a few generic structures which uh, which will contain all of the measured values. This could actually work fairly generically. Um, let's add. Uh, let's see what what I will need to move because um, I have several structures already in my top level application, which would be nice to move to the uh, specialized driver. Uh, so I have the um, I have the inputs for um, the voltages on all phases and uh, the currents. And also um, the pitch and yaw sensing, um, which is done by the encoder interface, uh, and the analog, um, the multiplexed uh, ADC as well. So um, at least the currents could go directly to the DRV chip driver. But um, it's gonna it's gonna be a few uh, extra fields, which kind of adds um, more to the um, potential messiness of this. So if I if I add uh, ADC, uh, already already can reference ADC. Uh, which is my generic ADC, which is uh, defined as an STM32 ADC. Um, and uh, 
another ADC is uh, is one of the multiplex channels, which uses one of the channels of this ADC, uh, but then also uses a multiplexer. And uh, uh, once uh, the conversions are um, as as the conversion happens, uh, every frame of the controller it will switch to a different channel and kind of get all of the measurements from the from the extra channels that way. Uh, which is currently not optimal. Uh, I think it would be better to um, do the switching in pro probably in the ADC um, conversion completed uh, callback, uh, so that I could uh, essentially um, measure measure all of the values much much quicker than uh, doing that every um, control frame, which is one millisecond. Um, but uh, that's also an architectural question which I should uh, have a think about so that I don't uh, create a really messy uh, code base uh, where things are uh, spread out uh, across multiple files, which I don't want. Uh, so this uh, needs to be done carefully here. Um, so what would be the interface I would want here? I would want to have um, I would want to read the measured values, essentially. But it would also be nice to read the raw values. OK, uh, so to keep things simple, uh, I think I will just um, I will just expose the DRV chips as um, little virtual devices, uh, which will have a, a register map, and then uh, I could um, set things like uh, the gain value um, uh, on on the chip. Uh, and then maybe have uh, a more, because this is going to be very application specific um, driver. Uh, it will need to know about, for example, the, the value of the current sense resistor, which is used on this particular board. Uh, so it's not generic to, to the DRV8302 chips. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, the usage of the GPIO pins is the same, uh, regardless of where the DRV8302 is used. Uh, so something that just simplifies, um, abstracts away uh, the details of, uh, of the GPIO pins. And something that can plug into the generic control loop as well. Uh, so let's, um, let's implement automatic uh, calibration upon... Um, upon startup, um, and we can do it like this. So I will add an API to, let's see here. I could add, uh, the lib driver specific API, so it's going to be like um, each bridge. Um, and this will operate. Uh, this is this is going to plug into the generic interface of a memory. Uh, of a memory device, uh, so that uh, and the reason the reason for doing it this way is that number one is that I want to have uh, a few generic interfaces which all drivers use, uh, which simplifies things a lot. Uh, the unfortunate part is that uh, all of the drivers rarely fit into uh, completely generic interfaces, um, but um, since I can have multiple interfaces exposed by the same driver. Uh, if I can combine the basic interfaces uh, and then write an API on top of that, then that solves the issue. And also, uh, one of the big benefits of using uh, abstract interfaces is that they're easily um, proved against uh, concurrency errors. Because if, uh, if we can make, uh, when we have uh, the details of the driver uh, contained in the C file, 
and then uh, just the, the public interface exported, then it's very easy to see which functions need to be uh, proved against uh, concurrent access. Uh, and it's usually the same functions uh, and they behave in the same way um, as long as the driver implements the same interface as some, some other driver. And when using the abstract interface, we can always be sure that um, there wouldn't be any co concurrency issues uh, as long as that uh, interface is proofed against concurrency issues on the driver side. Uh, so this means we can write completely re-entrant API on top of uh, the abstract interfaces, which will look like this. I type def the memory device, uh, and I can include memory device here. Uh, this would be loop firmware memory, uh, and then I can uh, write the interface like this. So, drv8302 um, set And then I can use this type def uh, just to make sure that uh, in my other code I can, uh, in my other code I use the, the right um, variable for uh, calling this API. It's going to be a simple API. This will, let's see. So probably just avoid. Okay. And then, uh, right. And this doesn't even need to. Um, to know the details of the memory device interface. So that's great. Let's see, what else could we have here? We could have... Um, this is the overcurrent mode. mode I think it's cycle by cycle um, let's see here Cycle uh, or DRV 8302 C mode shutdown. Well, let's just make sure that to avoid any ambiguity, we'll, yeah, uh, we'll number this uh, value. So this this will be zero. This will be one, uh, and that corresponds to the value of the pin as well. This will be our public interface to the device driver. DRV8302 uh, uh, enable. And um, we have uh, gain. Yeah, I can just call it 40. 
40 volts. Um, I think gain is uh, going to be, yeah, 40 volts is going to be when it's set to 1. And uh, let's see, ERB, uh, 8302. Ten volts when it's set to zero. What else? Uh, overcurrent warning and fault. These are um, let's see. the overcurrent warning. So overcurrent warning. Where is the overcurrent warning? So if you haven't seen my videos before, um, I'm doing uh, a lot of embedded programming and I show you how to uh, program embedded systems. Uh, I mostly program in C. Uh, I use C++ sometimes. Um, I use other languages for other things, but for embedded work, I mainly use C. Uh, and I also do um, circuit design. So you can subscribe to my channel on YouTube or find me elsewhere. <coughs> and I, <coughs> and if, uh, if, you need, if you're looking for uh, a consultant or um, somebody who can help you design a product or um, program some... Um, actually, for the most part, I would prefer to design the product myself instead of programming uh, somebody else's design product. But I could also offer programming uh, of uh, third-party products as well. If you want any of that, you can always contact me. Uh, and you can check out SwedishEmbedded.com uh, for more information on how to contact me. All right, so moving on. Um, in terms of our current warning, uh, it's going to be this is an or current and or temperature warning indicator. The output is open drain uh, with external resistor required. So uh, when does it actually trigger? Current limit uh, model of the device uses current limiting instead of a device shutdown during all current events. So this is basically the same thing like what the fuck. In current limit mode, the device uses current limiting instead of device shutdown during our current event. In current limit mode, device uses current limiting instead of device shutdown. Yeah, this is, this is just, uh, I guess, a typo. Somebody wrote the first paragraph and then started writing, and then went to the toilet or something and started writing the second paragraph and thought they didn't write the first paragraph in the first place. Uh, but I'm interested in uh, what else could trigger this. I guess this, this will be triggered every time there is an overcurrent condition. So let's let's call this overcurrent. So 
is in our current. All right, so this is uh, this is good enough. Uh, now I can implement the memory interface. Uh, yeah, I'll copy this. Now I'll go to the device driver and uh, I will just paste this code here. Um, just as a reference. Let's see. Uh, so we'll expose the memory interface and register this as a memory device. use the offset to specify the, the function that we want to, uh, to access. So everything will go through these two methods, uh, making it very easy to add a, a lock to, uh, to it. But in this case, we don't, we don't actually need to add a lock because uh, the GPIO driver will, uh, will have the locking in place. Uh, because this is, this is just going to be reading or uh, writing GPIO pins, uh, which will be specific to this uh, driver. I could actually specify even the GPIO pins, uh, the order of the GPIO pins here, like specifying the end pin, the gain pin, etc. Uh, I will not do that for now. I'll just define them. I have defines for the pins here in this uh, higher up in this file. Uh, okay, so um, read will uh, read into a void pointer data uh, and size t and size and. Uh, See, switch on the offset, and uh, do like this. Uh, actually, this is going to be just uh, the overcurrent and error. Let's see. So you see why I want to do it this way? Because I don't want to care about the details of this uh, anywhere else in my code in the application. Uh, I don't want to care about which GPIO pins uh, should be read in order to, to read this particular fault pin. So this is a good abstraction. So I'll be hiding this interface, so this is not going to be publicly available. This is going to be hidden behind uh, these methods. So now we can use uint8. UNT same as we use here. And this will be our current. What's going on here? I have an output parenthesis there. Uh, and then return one. Uh, great. And if 
of size not one two, uh, and this is good because uh, if, if this uh, uh, since it's going to be a, a like a, a publicly uh, visible memory device that any other driver could query uh, by mistake for example if you uh, configure some driver with with some memory device uh, pointing to this particular node in the device tree, uh, then uh, that driver could actually read some, some data into, yeah, in this case, this is, this is just, uh, it always assumes that there is one um, element in the data array. Uh, so usually this will not be a problem, but I still check uh, if, the, if the size is um, one, uh, and then we can uh, just add some here. This has only minimal overhead as well. Right interface for writing. And this will have const void. It's always good uh, when you have a write function that writes some data that only reads uh, a parameter. It's always good to use const because uh, you could have uh, static data that you're going to be writing, uh, and uh, that data will be const. Uh, and if if you don't have const in your method, um, then uh, you will get a compiler, compiler error uh, saying that you're discarding const uh, from uh, that particular parameter. Uh, so you'll have to change the method afterwards. Um, anyway, yeah, so you'll have to change it anyway. So uh, I prefer to always use const when I know that the parameter is only going to be read and never written. set Can we always rely that the boolean is a uh, uint date? I don't know. Let's see.
damn it. Stop doing that. I know why it's doing that. Because of that. Because of the semicolon. Okay. Uh, OC mode and calibration. DC calibration. Okay, cool. So, um, we'll just have to add this. Let's see. Reset that. Uh, then we have the OC mode. Okay, let's just do like this. TRV three or two. cycle by cycle, uh, then we just make it like that. Uh, let's see, so if cycle by cycle, do we, um, that's, that's when it's zero, so this, this is going to be, here the GPI pin will be reset. It's going to be set. and gain. So let's see. Yeah, I could just go like this. If uh, data so what I'm doing here is just I'm converting the, the void pointer, the generic void pointer, into a pointer to uint8, uh, and then I get the value of that um, of the data contained there. And if it's uh, anything but zero, then uh, I set the GPI up. Okay. 
have no idea why it does that when it comes to indentation. Probably I have to re revise my uh, settings. Let's see. Um, so this is Cal. What, what else is left? I think it was um, game. Yeah. Then we reset the pin. Otherwise, we set the pin. Now I just need to add the offsets. And then we'll uh, just register the memory interface. So, let's see. write and read, I also have to retrieve the pointer to the actual structure, so it's going to be struct uh, drd302 uh, self equals container of uh, dev uh, struct drd802 uh, mem ops. Uh, so what this does is that it retrieves the pointer from this pointer, which is actually a pointer to the ops structure in the memory device, uh, which is always the case for all devices. Uh, always the device and ops, and I ensure that with a uh, with the way I define uh, devices or device classes. Uh, and the same thing here, uh, mem ops. So this will only ever be called uh, from within this driver. Uh, so the memory device that is being passed here uh, should always point to mem ops. Or in fact, will always point to memops because uh, the only way to call these functions are through the memory interface. So uh, the last thing is to define the structure for the ops. 
memory device ops uh, memory ops equals uh, read And now, uh, during the startup, I will um, actually I'm going to add another function here. Probably make this into macro later. Uh, so this will be FTT, FTT node. Should basically just uh, call the. Ah, this is not needed. Just like this. Let's see, so we have. I have two of them. And then over here, I'll just retrieve the DRV chips. And this will probably then go to. Uh, to a more specialized motor driver. This shouldn't actually be called motor one. reference will be here. So DRV pitch and yaw.
not so happy with the fact that it's so much uh, typing. It's a bit annoying. Um, it, it kind of feels a little bit messy. Um, but at the same time, I feel that uh, this is rather clean solution to, to the problem of having all of these devices, and all of these different peripherals on the board being able to access them in fairly generic ways and in safe ways as well because we have multiple tasks running and they can all in theory uh, use some devices concurrently uh, okay so um, now I need to implement the DC calibration and when I've done that, I will uh, go ahead and implement the measurement. So let's see where we can do the DC calibration. Let's put the C calibration here. Cal. Then we're going to wait uh, a small while, uh, maybe like 10 milliseconds, uh, and then we'll read the ADC. Um, and I think we'll read, uh, I think I'll do this uh, multiple times as well, uh, so that I don't uh, just use one value, but rather use an average of several values. Uh, so I'll do this, um, I'll do this for 10 samples, um, considerable time apart. So let's see. Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to do like this. just um, I, I thought that I would just uh, write a for loop and uh, loop over the chips but I think uh, I will uh, unwrap this loop and just uh, write it uh, for each chip in sequence um, we can do like this actually four values, four calibration values that I'm going to save in the config. Um, so I'll set them to zero. And then uh,
Where's my ADC definition here? Yeah, this, these are the channels I'm going to be reading. So the ADC measurements are going to be happening uh, automatically because they're clocked by the PWM uh, update interrupt uh, or actually the update event. Uh, there is uh, no um, interrupt uh, starting the ADC conversion. It happens automatically within the chip. Uh, so we'll always have the values after a small delay uh, and it's much less than one millisecond, but I'm going to be waiting um, 10 milliseconds because I want to get uh, values sufficiently apart. them. Always a good idea to initialize um, when you don't know if this function will actually update the value. Um, PA plus A plus PB plus A plus PC plus uh, oh, CYA and then thread sleep. One of the biggest benefits of using um, threading is that you can actually release the CPU. So you yield the CPU for the amount of time that you specify here. And, uh, and I'll use 10 milliseconds here. So other things can actually continue happening while uh, this particular initialization thread uh, is disabled. So, um, and then I'll just uh, divide this by value here. Okay. And then we exit the calibration mode on both chips. Now I should have the calibration values in the DC cal config variable. I'm just going to add that variable to my config. make this in 32. Uh, when it comes to config, um, things like this that we'll probably write to EEPROM, it's always good to, uh, to use definite type so that you know exactly how wide it is. Uh, so, all right. 
So we got the DCCal values, uh, and next step is now to um, let's see the inputs here. So we have inputs, uh, we have the raw values there. And now I will just go to measurements. Let's see. I have a function called process measurements, uh, and then I'll update the current here. This is, by the way, a nice formula here for, uh, for updating the temperature. Uh, it uses the uh, B coefficient of the NTC resistor. This is probably also should be in the config. For now, it's just hard coded. Um, let's see. So here it's going to be self uh, measured. Um, and what is it called? E A H. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, and we have four of them. IB pitch and uh, I A uh, yaw and I B yaw uh, and this will be calculated like this. So um, depending on the gain uh, that we're using for the Should I actually just read this from the driver? This would actually make a lot of sense to have this in the driver. I'll do this like this for now. Uh, float gain is um, 10 by default and uh, actually it'll be like this. So let's get the gain. And actually, my ADC interface should uh, should be returning uh, voltage level instead of uh, the raw value. To decouple it from the precision setting of the ADC. Uh, anyway, that's for that's for next 
some video in the future as for the next set of improvements. Uh, so the, the way we calculate the voltage now uh, is by subtracting the DC gain from the ADC measurement. So we have cell uh, inputs in a pitch. This will be divided by 1496, um, which makes it uh, rather reasonable to make this float. Uh, and then, so that would be the value in volts, um, and then divided by the pitch gain in this case, uh, which will give us the voltage uh, on the input of the current sense uh, amplifier. So the next thing then is to, uh, let's just for now have a constant here uh, for the uh, resistor value is 0 0.005 ohms. Uh, so we have uh, our voltage divided by resistance which gives us current. So this will be divided by S. Let's see what this gives us. There's definitely a lot of room for, us, for simplification here. Um, again, yeah. uh -huh. So the, the reason that these functions are re-entered is because they're not using any uh, member variables uh, in the structure. They're just calling, uh, they're using a variable on the stack and then they're just calling this interface function. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, basically all of the functions here are re-entered. But uh, in terms of um, thread safety, um, these functions are completely thread safe and then uh, the memory read is thread safe as long as the GPIO uh, set and uh, reset are thread safe. Um, so let's see. Okay. I 
I wonder if I can read the GPIO uh, from the STM32 like this. Uh, if I can just do a GPI read bits uh, and get the output register of the GPI pin. So in, in, in the STM32 GPI driver I use the read, uh, read bits uh, function uh, from the STM32 library to, to get the, the bits. Am I not specifying this path? Probably I'm not, because I'm not using this uh, the header file so much. Uh, let's see. Alright, so source there good. That's the path I need.
bunch of typos. GCC. Thank you. Compatible point pointer type. Why? Um, let's see here. So memory device ops. Oh, so the the offset is a size size T. This is not available because I haven't added it to the install list. Let's see. What did I call it? Didn't I call it the early pitch? Conversion to float uh, from int32 and alter its value. In this case, it's okay. It is a small integer, but it's nice to get the warning because uh, if it was a large integer, then the precision may be lost.
accept calibration. And just change this. Enable calibration. Ah, enable calibration is good. more left. If all right, we are flashing. Let's see how this works. Will it completely crash? Or will, it, will it actually work? So I got some calibration values is encouraging. Uh, and then at the measurements and we're getting some values there. That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and change this uh, function where I print out the currents. Let's see. Um, data. So instead of uh, using inputs, I'm going to use measurements. And this would be expressed in milliamps. Now we can get a continuous uh, display of the currents. All right. Awesome. That, that looks correct. So according to my supply, I'm consuming 1.3 amps right now. Uh, it's not really correct. But I know that that supply um, does not have a very accurate current sensor. Okay. And uh, they consume, the motors consume, yeah, th th this seems to make sense. So when I, when I move this motor, uh, I get 0 0.3 amps. Um, and when I move this motor, I get uh, 1.4, 1.3. It seems to make sense. Um, I could make uh, a more. I could take actually a more accurate measurement uh, using my multimeter. Um, let's see here. Can I get the multimeter? Actually, be very fun experiment to do. So, get multimeter set into 10 amp mode, and uh, I will then disconnect that one. Let's see here. I'm trying to just make the probe stick to the cable. Um, I think I'll do like this. Let's see. I need some kind of clamp. I think I have a clamp somewhere. I'm 
I'll see if I can bring the multimeter in front of the camera. Okay, right. And the other lead of the multimeter goes to the power supply. And now I should have a little bit better current measurement. Okay, let's see. Okay, interesting. Um, actually, I think I did something wrong here. Uh, let, let's have a look here. Uh, you'll see what I mean. If I bring up the multimeter here, so the multimeter is showing um, this is the idle consumption, um, but uh, it's going to show twice the value that I see here. Let's see. And that's because I've been. Um, I've been scaling it wrong uh, by 4096 when instead I should be taking half of that because it's uh, it's a bidirectional sensor which uh, swings around the midpoint. Let's have a look here. So I move the um, the pitch motor. And I get 49, and I get. Uh, Minus uh, minus 250 milliamps. And if I use this motor, I get 1.53 uh, amps on the multimeter, and there I get around 800, uh, 7 800. So it's it's pretty exact. It's it's pretty good. Uh, I I think it's uh, it's very reasonable. Uh, looks uh, good enough, definitely for doing field oriented control uh, when uh, using a three phase motor instead of C motor, but even with the C motor, I could uh, use these measurements to uh, to have uh, very accurate uh, torque control on the motor. Uh, so um, that's it. I'm just going to change uh, the scaling uh, to be um, uh, to be 2048 instead of 4096, and then I'm done. So now I should be getting, let's see, yeah, now I'm getting 1.6 amps, 1.5, 1.6. It's a bit noisy there, but that's that's how the currents are in a, in a motor. They are noisy. What matters is the uh, cycle to cycle measurement. Um, and you can see they go in in opposite direction depending on the direction of the motor. So. That's it for now, and uh, I hope this was interesting. I hope you learned something, and I hope that uh, this can answer some of your questions when it comes to design of uh, motor control hardware. Thanks for watching. Bye.